one of the things I really had a problem with was the lack of transparency, and I said it's been about as transparent as mud, and it's very troublesome to me. Now, the debt deal itself um, offers a 10-year roadmap for cuts that are just under about uh, just under a trillion dollars, and a super commission or joint committee uh, that's going to issue uh, further cuts. Now, history has taught us that Congress simply cannot be trusted when there are a 10-year time frame because another Congress comes in and they don't fulfill the obligation. Do you truly believe that Congress will follow through on this plan over a 10-year term? And why does Congress need a commission or a committee or anything like that to issue options when that's basically the job of the Congress and the representatives as a whole? Well, as to the first point, I don't think Congress will follow through with it. I don't think Congress will end up making the total of, uh, you know, two to two and a half trillion dollars in cuts contemplated under this act. The reason is that most of the cuts are planned for uh, several years down the road toward the end of the 10-year window uh, that the law is looking at. And the problem with that is that that purports to bind Congresses that have not yet been elected, Congresses that will be sworn in on January of 2013 and January of 2015 and so forth. We can make decisions that are binding only on this Congress that's in power now. What tends to happen when we purport to bind the spending decisions of future Congresses is that those future Congresses will make their own decisions, and they won't necessarily, in fact, they don't often honor and respect cutting decisions that have made, been made by, uh, by past uh, Congresses. So that's one problem with it, and one reason why I've argued and why I make the point in my book, The Freedom Agenda, uh, that the only way to solve this problem, this excessive spending problem, is by restricting Congress's deficit spending power by enacting a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Now, you, along with uh, Senator Dean Heller, who was just appointed uh, in the great state of Nevada, have, uh, have joined together on the Budget Control uh, Joint Committee Transparency Act, or S-1501, and there, there are four other senators that are joining you along uh, in this fight. There's Senator Kelly Ayat, there's Senator uh, John Guzman, Senator Ron Johnson, uh, Senator David Bitter. And you're all going against, um, basically, uh, against what has happened, the lack of transparency, which we were promised. And I think we don't even need to be promised that. I think that's an obligation and a mandate from the representatives to the people, uh, especially something this big and this, you know, quote, historic. Now, I, uh, how do you feel having been left out, and a lot of members of Congress have been left out, and I've asked members of Congress I interviewed, Senator Jim DeMinn, Congressman Farenthold, Congressman Mike Rogers, I've asked them all, how do they feel about being left out of something that's this big? And, you know, you've got to go back to your constituents, and people in your office have to answer the constituents' concerns and, you know, issues that they're having. So how did you feel being left out of all these negotiations and basically being left in the dark? Might have lost him. Let's see if I lost him. Yep, I lost him. Let me try to give him a call back. See if we can get him back. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Eight zero one four six. Try to let's try that all over again. <laughs> so I guess he was trying to call back into the show, but let's try. And El Center. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I lost hey. the connection somehow. Terribly sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I don't know if you heard the last question that I was asking, uh, I don't know, uh, or how much of it you yes. heard. Yes, I, I heard the question, and, and uh, it got dropped just as I was about to answer. So, um, yeah, I, I don't feel great, obviously, uh, about that dynamic that you've described, about uh, not only me, but everyone else who voted against this act being left out of any opportunity to serve on the Debt Commission. Now, that said, I never expected to serve on it. I, I would actually feel some conflict in serving on this one because I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and the reason I don't think it's a good idea is because I think that on an issue as important as this one, as deciding what to cut and over what period of time to cut it, we ought to have debate and discussions that occur um, not under cover of darkness, but with the light of day. You know what they say about sunshine, it, it, it illuminates and it disinfects. And I think it would work much better if we submitted proposals, had them openly aired, debated, discussed, and as necessary, amended in an open amendment process on the floor of the Senate and the floor of the House as we proceed. I have, am not a big fan of these deals that are pre-baked behind closed doors by a small handful of members of Congress 
then submitted us did to us uh, kind of at the final hour, uh, usually as we're rushing up against some deadline, and uh, we're told, you either vote for this or against it. You've got no opportunity to amend it. Um, you've got uh, a limited time to decide it and um, just say yes or no. That ends up producing not really the best results. That's, that's what gave us the continuing resolution deal that was accomplished a few months ago to avoid the government shutdown, uh, one that promised to cut $38 billion and didn't, uh, as it turned out, cut much or anything. Um, this deal that was just concocted, for example, proposes to cut $7 billion in fiscal year 2012. Some of my colleagues who have looked at it have said it actually amounts to a $23 billion increase in spending, not a cut at all. And even if you look at the $7 billion cut promise uh, uh, on its face value, um, that's a little bit like saying to someone who is at the bottom of a 1,500-foot deep pit, hey, I'm going to throw you a ladder, and then throwing them a ladder that's only seven feet tall and saying, there, we, we've, uh, we're, we're solving the problem. We've got a much bigger problem, and this is a problem that ought to be discussed in open debate and discussion with an open amendment process. This committee process bypasses that, and, and uh, that's one of the many reasons why I'm opposed to it. I agree with you 100% with that. Something like this, something as historic as this, which, by the way, was billed as, you know, the greatest deal and kind of a cornerstone piece of legislation for Obama, yet, I mean, maybe he was embarrassed about it or whatever, but it was signed behind closed doors, so kind of true to fashion with the whole uh, the debate went, and uh, I was a little ticked off by that as well, and I hope the American people were as well. Um, your book, The Freedom Agenda, I do want to talk about that, but I do have a couple more questions, being that, you know, you are fighting for for the people just based on your record and based on your speeches and everything that you put out. You're not just speaking it, you're walking it, and I, I always appreciate that. Um, do you feel that the Republican leadership is in need of a moment of clarity, such as what Senator Tom Coburn has suggested? Yes, well, I, I like and respect Tom Coburn and appreciate what he's done uh, to identify a lot of areas where we can make cuts. He's identified something like $9 trillion worth of cuts that we could make over the, ne the next 10 years, and I think that kind of uh, approach is very helpful. Uh, in July, uh, Obama signed 600-plus regulations just in that one month. I, I think that's important to, uh, to underline. 600-plus regulations just in the month of July, uh, July coming from one person and just the federal government, and then the state governments have their own regulations. So it's, it's, it, it's getting to a point where businesses are getting even harder and harder to just start up, forget operating, but just starting up, just the costs associated with compliance. And this new wave of regulation from the Obama administration is expected to cost about $12 million in, in compliance costs. Do you think the regulatory environment and the regulatory wave, which is what Obama kind of rode to victory in 2008, do you think it's gone too far, and how far has it gone? What, what do you know that the regulations are doing uh, to businesses directly right now? I mean, we're talking about big industry right now that, that really moved the markets. Yeah, I do think they've gone too far, and I want to be very clear about something. Ed. This is uh, You've touched on an issue that is of utmost importance, so much so that I devoted an entire chapter of my book, The Freedom Agenda, uh, uh, to this issue, because as I explain in The Freedom Agenda, one of the reasons why it's been so difficult for us to uh, balance our budget, uh, separate and apart from the fact that we're spending too much, um, some, of, some of it has to do with the fact that our revenue stream is hurt by the fact that the federal government's regulating us so heavily that it's impairing, impeding economic activity that could otherwise be creating new jobs and growth. And so a problem that we've had is that uh, we've had lawmaking by regulatory fiat, meaning our laws under the Constitution are supposed to be enacted by Congress. People elected by uh, the voters uh, who stand at regular intervals for re-election so that laws are not supposed to be passed and go into effect without elected representatives uh, agreeing on it and then submitting it to the president for signature or veto. The, the process of promulgating new administrative regulations allows people who are neither elected by the people nor accountable to anyone who is elected to simply make law. And that's a problem. I think it needs to be Congress that makes the law and 
not some administrative agency. And so what I would like to see is a system whereby administratively promulgated regulations will sunset after a fixed period of time, maybe six months, uh, for example, unless Congress has affirmatively enacted it into law and submitted it to the President for his signature. That would be a breath of fresh air. I don't think anything in government should ever be permanent, especially something like regulation, because, you know, with the, let's say you regulate the uh, oil industry within five, six months if the price inflates and it goes to, I don't know, $120, $130, $140 a barrel, similar to what we saw in the Bush years, you know, people are going to be screaming for more oil and then they can't produce more oil because of regulation, because we can't drill an anwar, because we can't do this, this, and this. We can't do vertical drilling, which is what they're trying to do out in the um, in uh, North and uh, South Dakota, I believe it is. It's it's a very scary situation uh, situation for businesses, and I, I don't think the administration, I don't think very many politicians understand it, um, but especially in this administration, because they've had so few, I think about 8% of the, the cabinet has actually worked in the private sector, and, and that's a very scary number for me, uh, for have, to have someone in such a high office and be surrounded by people that are just government-minded, and it's very scary. Now, Part of the problem with Congress and the budget process is that you guys are running off baseline budgeting, which was established in the 1970s. Now, if you can kindly detail exactly what that means for the people, just break it down as simply as possible, and why it's problematic for you guys to actually do your job and effectively cut entitlement spending or any kind of spending, because that's when it becomes politicized, because whenever you do it, you have to put a completely separate piece of legislation, or you have to bury it into something else, and that obviously creates the, uh, you know, the, the train size uh, piece of legislation that we've had over the last few years, which is, you know, 2,500 pages, 2,700 pages, et cetera, et cetera. So tell us the problem with baseline budgeting and how it could be corrected, repealed, changed, whatever could be done to correct it. The simplest way I can explain the phenomenon that you're describing is to say that Congress plans ahead uh, based on what it's likely to spend, based on what existing programs are likely to cost over the next 10-year uh, period or so. We call that the baseline, such that Congress can call something a spending cut. Uh, it, it, it can claim that it's cutting spending in the future year, um, in the following fiscal year, for example, when in fact it's spending more than it spent the previous year. The reason they can claim that is because the baseline budget might indicate that Congress was going to spend even more than it ended up spending, but spent somewhat less than what it was initially projected to spend. So, you know, nobody, nobody would ever run their home or their business or their state or local government that way. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, and Congress shouldn't either. And so Congress ought not be able to claim that it's cutting spending unless it's actually spending less than it has been spending in previous years. And uh, it's a simple uh, method of uh, – simple uh, strategy that involves changing accounting to the same way that most people uh, run their businesses and their homes and so forth. I was trying to actually explain that to a friend of mine the other day, and I think it's funny because I told him that, you know, there's uh, language manipulation and number manipulation, and that's constant. That's been the way of the government for a long time because they just can't find a way to be transparent with the people that elected them. But I was trying to explain to him that Congress can spend 3 4 5% more, 7 6% more every year and still define it as a cut because they were, you know, the planned spend was 8 or 9%. So they can, even if it was just mere percentage points more, they call it a cut, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, government's not growing. They're leaving us alone. They're letting us pursue our life. And a lot of people get tricked with this, especially uh, headline readers, people that don't actually dive into the article, article or listen to shows such as, my, uh, such as mine or read books such as yours. They don't understand this concept and, the, you know, the trickery and, you know, the, 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 it's a scheme, basically, in my opinion. But uh, once again, yeah. I'm with Senator Mike Lee of Utah. I want to thank you once again for coming on. I want to talk about your book now, and I want to focus on why it's important, because Senator Jim DeMint just released the book as well, and I had him on to speak about it. But tell us what you're trying to accomplish with, you know, with, with this book. Okay. In a nutshell, my book, The Freedom Agenda, is designed to help Americans understand how we got into the mess that we're in, where... We have a federal government that was supposed to have only limited powers, but now regulates almost every aspect of our lives. Uh, 